This is Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. I've got with me my co-host, Chuck Nice. And together we welcome my friend and colleague, Michio Kaku, who's a professor of theoretical physics at the City College of New York. And he just published a book titled Quantum Supremacy. <laughs> and we're taking questions from our Patreon members. Chuck, what's the first question up that you got? All right, here's Daniel Kilikowski, or Kulikowski. That's probably Daniel Kulikowski, who says, Hello, Dr. Tyson, Dr. Kaku, and I will assume Lord Nice. From the research <laughs> triangle of North Carolina, I hail, and I would like to ask, what would you say is the biggest national security consideration of quantum computing technology? Oh, I love it. Yeah, Isn't that Michio. something? Good. All good right. What do you got there, going there, Nietzsche? Daniel? Well, the biggest national security question about quantum computers is the fact that the CIA would be put out of business. Uh, <laughs> all security people would be fired uh, because all the secrets all the secrets would be open to anybody with a quantum computer. Any teenager with a quantum computer would be able to tap into, you know, the crown jewels of wait, any wait. security. Wait, wait, sure I try to log into my own bank account. If I get the password wrong three times, it locks me out and I have to call in to get reestablished. So how is it that a quantum computer can get into my bank account by testing a billion, zillion, squillion passwords and I can't, because I, I mess up, I got fat thumbs three times in a row. Well, if you want to break into a computer of, of a bank, the first thing the computer asks you for is to uh, factorize this number. This number has maybe 100 digits. And how long will it take you to factorize a number with 100 digits? A few thousand years. So in other words, yeah, you could break into a, a, a regular bank, but it would take a few thousand years to do that. With a quantum computer, you could do that with the flick of a dial. That's the power by because the computer asks you, please factorize this number. If you can wait, wait, do wait. That, no computer has ever asked me to do that. Are you saying that's happening <laughs> under the hood? <laughs> if, if that if that were the starter question, nobody would have any access to any computer yeah. at all. So is that just happening under the hood? And by the way, that's why I never turned on uh, my uh, two factor. Oh, you worried you'll get locked out? Uh, yeah. If you have a password of, let's say, six digits, how long would it take for a computer to go through every single one of those six digits? This is my point. When I mess up three times, I'm locked out for for an hour, all right? So <laughs> why do I believe that it can blow through a bajillion, squillion attempts and then get in? Why should because, I believe because that? Because this is not how the average person gets into a site. This is how the banks monitor who comes into the site. This is how this is what the big boys do when they start to talk to each other. Uh, they don't use these little passwords. That's they use under factorization. the hood. It's under the hood. Okay. So, all right. No, but maybe it's not that the CIA will go out of business or all security will go out of business. It's that we came up with this this security protocol knowing it was out of reach of traditional computing. So surely there's another security security protocol mm -hmm. where quantum computing would take a thousand years isn't there or not well so, so far the highest level of security is done by factorization okay no but that, that's that, how but banks talk to each other it was invented because we knew it was hard for computers so right. it you're smart come up with something else that what the, the, what would come after factorization and right. you know what, what would be here's a better question how would I stop a quantum computer from getting into my stuff? Right. With a gun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which is America. <laughs> we'll stop you at the front steps. Uh, that's, the most, no, so I, that's the most patriotic <laughs> answer you can have. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. So, Michio, it just seems to me... We have smart people out there. They come up with some other task that would be damn near impossible or, or forever task even for quantum computing. There's bound to be something, 
right? If you could find it and patent it or copyright it, it'd be a rich man right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because it's the early days, the right? Re- you're right, the world economy it rests on this, the answer to this question. The world economy. Oh, wow. Okay. You could break into anything you want if you had a way to get around some of these protocols. So, mm-hmm. so now we know what the real motivation for this race is. Oh. <laughs> now it's we money. know what it is. It's money. It's, it's, it's money. It, who, he who rules the quantum computer rules the rules world. Rules the world economy. Damn. That's right. They, rules the world economy. Right? That's crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, That's why people work on it. That's right. why he wrote the book. Hey, look, look. <laughs> this, is, this is coming very fast. Hey, guys, apologies for the interruption. I wanted to take a quick break and thank our partners at AG1 for sponsoring today's video. Now, for those of you who don't know, AG1 is a foundational nutritional supplement that supports whole body health. Made up of 75 high quality ingredients, AG1 not only supports immunity, especially during my busiest days, it also replenishes the nutrients in our bodies and it balances mood and stress levels like those times when my kids are getting on my nerves. But just don't take it from me. AG1 is made up of the highest quality ingredients and is even NSF certified for sport, meaning it's approved by some of the strictest regulations in professional sports. Now, I'm a new consumer of AG1, but what I love is they make it so simple. All you have to do is toss in a scoop. Now, I like to use almond milk and then of course you give it a little shake and <laughs> all right it tastes good too i'm telling you guys it doesn't get any easier than this so listen if you are interested in trying this for yourself visit drinkag1.com slash star talk to get a free one year supply of AG vitamin D3 plus K2 and five AG travel packs with your first purchase. Thanks again to our friends at AG1 for sponsoring today's video and giving me some delicious nutrition. Mm -hmm. This is your book, Quantum Supremacy. That's the title of your damn book. Quantum Supremacy. That's right. How quantum computing will change everything. everything. Wow. All right. Chuck, Italy. you got another question. This is Gavin Bomber uh, from North Vancouver. And mm-hmm. he says, hello, and please visit. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> He's lonely up there. I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if, if anyone identifies their location in Canada as north of anything, it's got to be cold and lonely. Yeah. Because <laughs> most of the Canadian population is like right at the border right. with the United States. Right. So, that makes sense. Yeah. He's North Vancouver. All he right. says, um, how is quantum computing going to be used to help solve the climate crisis? Oh, I like that. That's a really great good one. Yeah. Michio, what what are we not being able to compute that quantum computing will do for us? Will it make better weather models, better climate models? That's one thing. I uh, realize that when you model the Earth, how do you model the planet Earth? You divide the atmosphere into cubes, and then you calculate the weather in each cube, and then you average it over the entire Earth. That's how you calculate the weather of the future. Now. Each, how big is each cube? Each cube is several miles across. Now you say to yourself, what? If each data point is a few miles across, you can't trust any of these results. And that's the problem. Well, that's because something could be happening at the edge of the mile and they'll average it into where you are and it won't apply. Okay, so that means you want smaller cubes in your mind. Smaller cubes, that's right. That's where quantum computers comes in because they are infinitely more powerful. The the, uh, things that they manipulate are not zeros and ones on zeros and ones for each 10 mile cube. No, they are infinitely small. And so now you begin to realize the power of this technique. We're going down to the molecular scale. We're going down to a scale that is unreachable with digital computers. Wait, so Eeyore was ahead of his time. <laughs> Do you remember Eeyore? The Eeyore donkey? from Winnie the Pooh, the donkey. Wow. I think it's Eeyore. He has a cloud that's raining just over him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So whatever the weather modeling, the cube is small enough to just affect the donkey and nobody else. That's that's the kind of weather precision you're talking about here. Right. And, you know, when a hurricane is about to hit Florida, they have all the projections of where it's going to hit landfall. And then you see all the different kinds of trajectories. They're way off. 
They're way right. off. And these are the best computers that we have. Well, in all fairness, they start close to each other, and then they diverge, diverge as, that's right. as, uh, over time. So right. how reliable right. is that, right? With right. a quantum uh, computer, you should be able to get much, much better numbers because of the fact that each cube that you're averaging over is not 10 miles across, right. but maybe a few feet across. Wow. And my, my favorite Trump joke ever was um, that Trump only got interested in climate change and and weather when he found out that they model uh, that the, <laughs> the hurricane used European models. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually a good joke. That's a good joke. Yeah, that's, that's a good, good joke. joke. Yeah. I heard, I'll take credit for that. Right. But um, <laughs> so, Michio, why the Europeans had what different computing power or different ideas about how weather systems would operate relative to we here across the pond. Each computer program has a different way of chopping up the earth in terms of cubes. And then within each cube, using equations to model the weather in each individual cube. And then lastly, to then wrap all these cubes together to get the weather of the entire earth. That's a lot of assumptions. That's a lot of models. And right. that's why we can never predict the exact path of a hurricane. You see that every time. I just wouldn't have thought that a continent would have its own set of models relative to another continent. That's all. Right. That seemed that seemed kind of provincial to me. Mm. The, well, the, you got the, it. The Euro model. <laughs> <laughs> Digital computers are very provincial. <laughs> all right, Michio, it's great. We got your book out, uh, Quantum Supremacy. Aud audacious of you to title it that. I mean, I don't want that to be true, but we know that's what it's about. Yeah. We know, we know, we're just being that's honest. That's the name of the game. Yep. That's the name of the game. It's better than the Bourne supremacy. Good for oh. you. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck, one last question. See if we can fit one in. All right. Very this is David. Hey, David here from upstate New York. Hi to all. I don't think Dell and HP will be selling quantum computers at Walmart anytime soon, and that's what concerns me the most. Quantum computing will most likely be used by large corporations and governments and the ultra wealthy between AI and advanced quantum computing. Can you describe one benefit it will bring to me, the average person? Do you think it will unite humanity, divide us further into havens and haves and have nots? Please. Thank you in advance. Mm. Well, all, right. all technologies, when they are first invented, usually benefit the people who invested in it, which are usually wealthy people, people with connections. But then mass production kicks in, competition kicks in, prices start to go down as a consequence. But every technology, name them all, going back to the Stone Age, the first people to introduce technologies had the advantage and they used it to get rich or to get the powerful. It is true, Micho, wheels are pretty cheap today. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing with quantum computers. Eventually, we'll all have a chip. Uh, for example, in our contact lens, we'll have a connection to the internet in the cloud. The quantum computers will be in the cloud, and you you will access it with your wristwatch, your contact lens. You'll blink, and then you'll have access to the uh, computing power or the implant or the computer. neural implant. Yeah, right. or right. the neural implant. That's right. Mm -hmm. You simply think, okay. and you get access to a quantum computer. But first, All right. initially, yeah, it's going to be the big banks and the CIA and people like that that will be jumping on the computer, uh, uh, quantum computer bandwagon. But then prices will begin to drop because of competition, mass production. And they've always dropped for everything else. So that's the reason why you say that. That's yeah. right. And, and how quickly? Is this 10 years from now, 20 years, five I'd, years? Uh, well, right now, we, we already have achieved quantum supremacy. That's already been achieved, but not for, for general questions. That's what we want an all-purpose quantum computer for any general question, that'll take maybe another 10 years. Another 10 years. But we're going exponentially fast. We're up to 1,000 qubits now. That was unheard of. If you were to talk to somebody just 10 years ago, they'd shake their heads. What? You'd be lucky to have four or five qubits. Now we're up to 1,000. Eventually, we'll be up to a million. All right, Holy and then God. when you come back on the show, you will be an animatronic <laughs> <laughs> hologram. It'll, it'll just be his consciousness inside of, you know, some kind of pl plasma cloud. That <laughs> or just a jar. Right. Or I'll be, I'll be an avatar. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that was just a taste of a much longer conversation Star Talk had with Michio Kaku, friend and professor of physics at the City University of New York. Check it out on Star Talk. <laughs>